Hello, and thank you all for joining my SyncCon session on security begins with a secure dev environment. Actually, this is one of the scariest demos I think that I do, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Before we get underway, um, one thing I really love doing is just, well, I love sharing tech jokes because I have not only have so many of them, I mean, they're pretty good tech jokes. Yeah, maybe they're not. Anyway, you be, you decide. Um, but these are open source, so it's important we just keep smiling in these times. So this is an open source joke. Please share it amongst your teams, friends, devs, whoever, anyone that will get this. But anyway, why did the vulnerability get tied? It is a security joke. I didn't mention that. Why did the vulnerability get tied? Because it ran somewhere. Oh, I can feel the face palms already, even from this pre-recording. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. My name is Developer Steve. I'm one of the senior developer advocates here at Sneak. Um, I've been a developer advocate for many, many years now. So for the likes of PayPal, Braintree, for Zero, for Telstra, and for IBM. And amongst all that, I've also been a CTO and a developer. Actually, I've been coding since the age of eight. That's a whole other story in itself. Anyone that remembers QBasic, please put it in the chat. Um, I'll be on the chat. So hello, Dev Steve. I can see you. No, I can't. <laughs> it's kind of weird talking to yourself. Anyway, um, before we do get too far in, though, uh, I just want to do a shout out to the organizing crew at SyncCon. Um, I just know how much goes into events like this and how passionate the team is, particularly behind SyncCon. So I just wanted to give a big round of applause and a big thank you to uh, everyone that's organizing and help putting everything together. It has been particularly tricky, as we all know, in current times, given all the travel restrictions and all the meeting in person restrictions. So, I mean, special kudos for that as well. And I know the community is always very appreciative. So a round of applause, uh, big round of applause. Everyone put those applause emojis in. Anyway, I just wanted to say that because I am a big fan of open source communities. And I, I mean, every, as everyone knows, we all learn and uh, learn together. We all grow together. So that's why it, it's so important to always contribute back where you can. But you all know that. Anyway, I'm just going to recap some of the stuff we cover in our other session on code pipelines, because this kind of leads into some more detail around what we're looking at today. But as we all know, like there's uh, in a holistic iceberg view or as part of our SDLC, our cool SDLC, if you will, of the iceberg, I think there's a pub there, you'll get it. Um, but as we all know, like your code is or the code that you deploy or the code that you support and maintain is literally just the top of that iceberg stack, the, the bit just above the water or just above the surface of the internet, which is publicly available. Um, so many times I've deployed applications in my developer origin story that I later have to go back and clean because there's a vulnerability appearing inside my stack. Indeed, um, I mean, one of the things I love most about open source is just the growth that we see across all the ecosystems. So many people uh, coming together in different community groups to build out an amazingly functional app that as a dev, as a technology person, I can use to very quickly build out uh, existing functionality, literally just by NPM installing a thing or you know using a particular component, which means fewer lines of code and a lot more speed to getting those applications out the door. Of course, as we have all seen as security professionals is there's an emergence in the number of vulnerabilities now being discovered, which is what we're kind of looking at today. And hence why I wanted to cover off some of these basic things first because the second part of our cool iceberg stack is open source code, which of course your code is built on and leverages to build out, you know, you don't have to reinvent wheels. You just have to write a couple of lines of code and build out an amazing button, an amazing piece of a form, a really cool app, if you will. Oh, another iceberg joke. Oh, I'm going to get thrown out at this rate. Anyway, no. <laughs> Um, of course, the third part of our stack is containers, and we see an emergence of vulnerabilities appearing in a lot of Docker base images, for example, these days, because again, they're using the same, or they're built from the same open source components that we also find vulnerabilities in at the second stage of our stack, well, in the top stage as well, but you know what I mean. And the way I like to think about keeping containers clean is, and remember, always start with base possible image, only add the components in you need and build up from there. But the way I like to think of this is, yeah, with great containerization comes great responsibility. I do like that meme, just say it. 
And of course, the last part of our holistic SDLC is um, infrastructure as code, which is really cool because literally as a dev in a few lines of code, I can write out some YAML, which helps deploy my app. And when um, pipelines work really, really nicely as part of IAC and Jenkins always passes by test first time. No, it doesn't. <laughs> um, yeah, you can literally in a few lines of code write out um, the infrastructure that you need or the permissions that you need on your deployable app really, really quickly and really, really easily. But of course, there's a fifth element that we haven't really explored yet. And why are we here today? This is almost like the fifth beetle, if you will. <laughs> um, but yeah, this we missed something really, really important as part of that, that development life cycle. And then, of course, that is the development environment, which is kind of concerning. And again, this is why this particular vulnerability or these vulnerabilities that we're looking at today, and then I'm going to be live demoing maybe twice. We'll see. No, I'm going to do it twice. Anyway, totally going to work. But um, why these vulnerabilities kind of get a bit scary is because literally that is my local host. That's the place where I not only build stuff, but all my development keys are there. In fact, all my passwords are sitting in this one place. And now we're seeing more and more an emergence of um, these vulnerabilities starting to affect local development environments to the point where the first time we demoed, sneak demoed, one of the things we're going to be looking at today, my manager, Liren, um, with one of our security researchers on a live stream, had his password file from his Mac exposed uh, on the live stream. <laughs> so we'll get into that because I'm going to do it um, and I'm going to show you how I'm going to do it. But this is the, one of the things that makes this most uh, scary is it's not just accessing files on the computer, but also potentially accessing remote keys like IDE configuration, environmental variables, um, Whatever you are using in your local development environment, essentially, this now becomes vulnerable depending on what you've got installed. And so the important thing here is that whatever you've got installed, part of this. So, and it's important to always, I like to think of this as doing a spring clean. Like, you know, all those times you install, um, you brew install a thing or your VS code install an extension because you see it mentioned on a forum or it looks like it's going to you know, do the thing you think it's going to do, or you see it on Twitter or wherever. Um, it's important if uh, once you've decided not to use that anymore, remove it. Um, or the other way I like to do, think of this too is at the end of each month, do a spring clean. Go through what you have installed in your local environment, and if you're not using it, like take it out. You don't need it there anymore. Sometimes it might even just be for that one-off project that you no longer need to use it anymore. But the point is, make sure you, you need to be keeping track of what you've got installed in your local in your local host, because that's the that's the place we build stuff and that's the place we store all our keys and all the things. So always remember to make sure you know what you've got installed. So interestingly, um, Homebrew this year came out with a security incident disclosure in uh, April. It's basically, there was a security incident involving um, some GitHub actions that caused the potential for, and this was proven through a POC. There's a really good write-up in this actually, but um, there's a, um, yeah, there's a, a proof of concept behind what, it, what basically happened and what caused this security incident disclosure. And shout out to the homebrew folks too, because they moved really, really quickly on this to, well, fix it. Um, which I'm very thankful for because, I mean, I've, everyone uses that on Mac. Um, and again, this is about, um, this is one of the things I love about the open source communities is everyone comes together to not only learn, but also, you know, fix this stuff as quick as they possibly can, which is super, super important. So what we're looking at today is based on some research that Sneak did uh, back in May. So it was actually a month after the homebrew disclosure our security researchers, uh, Roll and Kirill, basically found a whole bunch of, uh, well, four VS Code extensions, which, I mean, there's 25,000 extensions in the VS Code ecosystem. They found four in particular that had some serious security vulnerabilities in them. So these are all now patched. As far as I know, they all are. Definitely the one we're looking at today um, is patched, and I'm going to look. We'll look at that uh, today as well. 
So, um, but the four four extensions we published some research around was uh, LaTeX Workshop, uh, Open in Default Browser, Instant Markdown that we're looking at today. And I hadn't heard of this uh, this last one, but um, there's one called Rainbow Fart. Um, I think it did some type of Ipsum stuff from memory. I forget what it did. But um, yeah, the I, that last one is real. You can totally look it up. Make sure you install the latest version though. Um, we do have full write-ups on all four on the sneak blog on that link uh, on the screen now. But I also have a, a write-up, a more detailed write-up on instant markdown on my GitHub repo. But we'll get to look at that in a little bit. I mean, again, the scariest part of this was um, 14 million monthly active users on VS Code. And like I said, there's 25,000 extensions. And a lot of these extensions use the same open source components we were looking at earlier in this presentation. So, I mean, that's probably one of the most concerning things. Again, this is about doing that due diligence and, well, making sure if you're not using something, you take it out. I'm the worst at that. Like in my local host, there's always that that thing you installed and never used, but continually either update or sometimes don't update. And this is potentially also making those vulnerabilities surface even more. So the one we're looking at today, and there's a write-up on, I have a GitHub uh, write-up on, like down to the, the most detailed write-up uh, on this particular extension vulnerability, the instant markdown vun, which is that link on there. Now, super important to know is 1.4.6 is the version we use with the vulnerability in it. 1.4.7 is the latest version. So this one scares me so much that I was getting ready to install it to basically build out the demo in my local, like I was getting ready to install it on my own local host. And I thought, do I really want to do that? So how I actually run this and you'll see is I run OS X inside of VM. Uh, with the vulnerability installed and like all the things, that's basically my target computer. And then I run the attack from my local host um, just to make sure things are a little bit more secure. Anyway, how it actually works. So what it does, and you can see here, this is from um, the write-up on the sneak blog as well, is essentially we social engineer a way for the target developer computer dev machine to basically open an ngrok link or open a remote server link, which in turn, and we'll take a look through the code as well in, in a second, but what it does is open a whole bunch of iframes and leverage the vulnerability inside of open port on the instant markdown extension. So you'll see, we'll run through a network analyzer on the target dev machine, and you'll see it like constantly looking through a file traversal, trying to find the target file, and once it finds it, sends it back to our um, attacking computer. It just sends it back through to a, um, like as post data and you save it as a file and then you've kind of got access to it. Um, the tricky part here is that social engineering hack, not impossible as we all know, but um, the tricky part to this entire operation is that social engineering hack. You essentially need to entice the target dev machine with something dev culture wise for them to need to open that, that particular file. Some of the other extensions that we've got write-ups on work a little bit differently. You can do uh, a couple of different um, remote attacks once you've got some things in place, but um, check out the full write-up for more on some of the other ones. We're just looking at the one extension today, uh, the VS Code uh, extension hack. So without, yeah, let's do it. Let's do this hack. Like I said, I've got full write-ups on here. I do have a disclaimer on there, which we should always make sure we include on this sort of stuff to make sure it's not a, considered malicious in any way. Um, what I'm actually using, so I'm, yes, I'm using PHP in this. You probably saw that already. Um, I like PHP, but you could do this in anything. In fact, the slide we were just looking at, um, Kirill and the security researcher use an Express app. You can do pretty much the same thing as long as you take the same approach to it. So I'm using um, PHP's built-in web server to basically do, to run the scripts locally. And then I'm just using ngrok through my ngrok subdomain. You can CNAME the ngrok link, or you can also just run the same thing on 
you know, through a custom domain remotely, like you could do some sort of Rick and Morty or pickle Rick reference. And again, the social engineering hack, there's a few ways I think that this could be done or that I could see this um, being executed. Oh, I just realized GitHub's got a 94% hack on there. On my GitHub repo, that's kind of fun. Um, I feel I feel achieved now. <laughs> the um, yeah, and I have full write ups on this, so you can um, if you want to try it yourself, please do. But again, like super don't super super critical. Do not leave this extension installed because it is bad. Um, yeah, I just I don't trust it. So inside the folder, we've essentially got two files running on the attacking machine. We have index.php and attract.php, again, just running through the PHP built-in local server. Um, essentially, what we do, where's my code? There's my code. What we do on the code side of things is we're basically traversing, we're using the open port inside the VS Code extension. So 8090 is the open port in the vulnerable extension, 1.4.6. And we're essentially going to open a whole bunch of iframes inside JavaScript once that link is clicked and try and look for a particular file. In this case, I'm just going to be doing a mini capture the flag of sorts and on the user's home directory, and we'll take a look once we get over to the, the dev target machine, I'm trying to grab a passwords file called passwords. Um, so yeah, super, super uh, cryptic. <laughs> Um, and I've got a got a phrase in there that we'll look at, but I mean you could do this to capture just about anything you wanted once once that file's open. Uh, essentially, it's just going to loop over and look for that particular file, and we'll have a look over there. And once it finds it, grab the content and then send it back to my ngrok instance to the other um, script I've got running, the track script. So and all that that's going to do, it's just going to send it as post data. And then all that the track script is going to do is grab any incoming post data, save it as a timestamped file, a text file, and that's kind of it. It's just going to save it as a post, uh, like as a post file. That's kind of it. Pretty easy on the. It's actually pretty surprisingly, concerningly easy on the attacking side of things. So anyway, well, it's even easier on the target computer. This is our target computer. So as you can see, I've got four extensions in, ex, installed. Where are they there? Um, Instant Markdown, I do have 1.4.6, and of course it wants to update to 1.4.7. Um, like I said, this is actually fixed in the latest version. The um, And shout out to the maintainer of this repository because it was updated very, very quickly. Um, you can see the changes that were made pretty quick to get this fixed, get this um, mitigated. So, and shout out to the maintainer, like amazing work, totally worth a worth a star on this one. Anyway, the and yeah, this was downloaded. This particular extension was used by one hundred and twenty seven thousand, and it still is one hundred twenty seven thousand um, users. So, fair chunk of people. Um, the, and again, you can go through and have a look at the other extensions. Like there's that rainbow file one. Um, actually, what did this one do? I forget. Uh, uh, oh, that's right. Rainbow file is an extension that keeps giving you a compliment while you're coding. I mean, that's kind of nice. But anyway, um, make sure you update to the latest version. As you can see in my uh, target dev machine, I am not using the latest version. Anyway, so the one we're demoing today is Instant Markdown. So what it does, test a live readme edit. So if I open Chrome now, you'll see that's now like, well, it's live Markdown doing what, it's, what it says it should. And as you can see, like it's doing, it's using port 8090, which kind of is, well, that's expected. No, let me close that one. There we go there. So for this to work, basically we're looking for, this is the um, the terminal at the user's home. And as you can see, I've got my CTF, my mini CTF uh, file, my target file there, passwords. So if I have a look at passwords, you'd see it's got hello sync on. Pretty basic, I just kept this one simple. But like you can put anything you want in there pretty much. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to extend this a little bit. 
and let's go to the amazing link I've just been sent. So just picture, if you will, imagination. Just picture, if you will, uh, developers just received this link, um, and it's from maybe it's from a well wisher, maybe it's from someone on Twitter. Just some random link going, oh wow, you have to check this link out. Um, let's see what this amazing link is. Oh. <gasps> Ah, uh, not only have I been Rickrolled, I just Rickrolled all of you. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome. Um, but as you can see, some a couple of things have happened in here. And I don't know whether you can see like these tiny little triangles or iframes down the bottom next to that image. But essentially, it's done what I thought it would do or what it's supposed to do. And basically opened a whole bunch of iframes behind in, as part of this page and on our file traversal looking for our target file. So if I come back over to here now, you'll be able to then see the file that it's opened. And you can see there, like it's now got a text file sitting there and hello Syncon sitting in that file. Ta-da! <laughs> um, if I look into that more, I don't know why the image didn't load. I think this VMs, there we go. And it probably just, yeah, just did it again. So if I switch back now to, actually, let's have a look at, you can see this in action. If I go to the network tab and then reload again, you'll be able to see it doing the, um, yeah, my VM's a little bit laggy. Um, you'll be able to see it in action because you can see there, like it's doing all the file traversals, trying to look for the file. And then when it finds it, you can see the last edit, the last version there, it's actually sent it to as post data to the ngrok track.php file, which is then where it's capturing. And you can see the contents of the file it's sending is hello syncon, um, basically. And that's kind of the hack. You can see why this one scares me so much though, right? Not only the Rickroll side of things, but also this literally would give, or does give a remote attacker the ability to grab a lot of very sensitive files from your target dev machine which is, um, well, to say the least, it is not cool. Totally not cool. So that's kind of the attack. Please, again, try it. If you want to try it, try it for yourself at home. Um, do so, but um, just don't leave this one installed longer than you need to just for researching. So, um, yeah, please don't leave it installed. Duh, you totally get it. Anyway, that is the VS code hack that scares me a whole bunch. So of course, this isn't the first time we've seen development environments um, exploited through applications or through dev applications. Um, the In 2019, we saw the likes of CVE 2019-13567, which basically used an exploit through a Zoom marketplace extension um, or a vulnerable Zoom marketplace extension to do some um, not so nice things on the development machine and be able to grab credentials. So, and the thing here is like, please be aware of what you're installing in your development environment. And remember to constantly be doing those reviews because I mean, you don't want anyone getting in and doing some nasty stuff inside your local dev environments. Nobody's got time for that. <laughs> and particularly like this is where, this is a place where we build all our amazing things out. So. Just some takeaways, and again, I just I can't iterate it enough. Is just be aware of what you install locally. Um, remember to continually do those spring cleanouts um, monthly. Every month can be spring, but remember to do those periodic cleanouts just to make sure if you've got something installed that, um, and you're going to keep using it, make sure it's updated. Make sure it's updated to a not so vulnerable version. But if you're not using something particularly with a brew install or VS code extensions, like take it out, get rid of it. You don't need to leave it in there anymore. Also just wanted to do a quick shout out. Um, we do in our other session as well, me and Vendana, but I wanted to do another shout out for the Sneak Ambassadors program. Um, we've just recently launched this and we're looking to help um, amazing community folks go out and build more awareness. Uh, amongst security people, amongst developers, amongst everyone, just building more security awareness and um, how to embrace that shift left. So if you're looking, if you want to get involved with the program or you want to find out more, um, hit up that link or reach out to me on social media and I would love to chat. So I'm at developer Steve 
pretty much everywhere except Twitch. Twitch, I'm developer underscore Steve because I can't remember my old Twitch login. Whole other story. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you want to find out more about the Sneak Ambassadors program, please reach out or check out that link for more details. And just lastly, I love ending my talks with this is please remember to use your tech superpowers for good and remember to be excellent to each other. Thank you very much. Any questions? Make sure you pop them in the chat. I'm not live. I've just popped them in the chat. <laughs> or reach out. Happy to connect. Um, but thank you very much.